Do you ever wonder if your first E5 was the correct decision? Do you ever find yourself lost on what E5 to build next? Well, hopefully this series is going to be an informative and educational series explaining to you strategy in Idle Heroes, choosing what heroes to build and when, and understanding what you can actually do with the things available on your account. We're going to be beginning this as part of a larger series where we talk about early game, mid game, and late game strategies, and how to approach the game with a constructive mindset. This is not about just building whatever heroes you hear are good and having an account that has no synergy whatsoever. This is about focusing, streamlining, and being as efficient as possible. People will tell you there is no skill in idle heroes, it's just about spending money and making yourself super powerful that way. That's not true. What resources you use and how you use them. Also, where you put your money if you do spend, and as well, what artifacts you choose to get when they are available to you really does determine your progress. As well, how you choose to build your E5s and how you use them together is really, really important. So that's what we're going to be talking about. My goals for this series are to be able to walk away with a good outline of early game strategies and habits that you can begin now to improve your progress in the long run. As well, I want you to be able to understand what you can and cannot do within the context of your account and how to use that information to determine how to progress next. As well, I want to set realistic expectations. A lot of people think that they can't do things on their account or that they can and get confused by having correct expectations. You're not going to be disappointed and you're going to have a focus. And that's the final thing. I want you to be able to watch this series and create realistic goals for your Idle Heroes account to work towards. Idle Heroes is a grind. It is about resource management, commitment, dedication, and efficiency. There's lots of things in life that you can learn by playing Idle Heroes, unless, of course, you throw money at this game and use no strategy whatsoever. If you play this game well, you will pick up life skills that can actually help you in the real world. Setting goals and expectations, planning, being efficient, all good things. Anyway, folks, let's begin with our first topic of today, and it is an early game strategy. I want to disclaim, there are many good early game strategies that are all dependent on the E5s you build first, and actually the direction you plan on going with the account. Some of them will interact with glory challenge rewards, others will focus on seal land, some will just want to go, woo, I want to get a transcendence hero as soon as possible. My advice to you guys is to just see each of these videos as they come and decide which one sounds fun to you. I'm going to be talking about my favorite early game strategy, one which is close to my heart because it includes and focuses around my favorite faction. Now, one difficult thing that people struggle to get into their heads is that when we play idle heroes, often when we talk about efficiency and strategy, we're focusing for long-term goals, not short-term. So that means game modes which are alien to you, such as The Void, which a lot of you as new players may have never seen, or even deeper things into Celestial Island, like the Cloud Island. These things might mean nothing to you. You might not understand how they work. But having a quick breakdown of how these things work will teach you about why what I'm about to tell you in this video is good. So, one quick thing you need to understand, when a hero gets to Void 4, which is the highest a hero can be, you can make them the owner of a home. In that home, you can have various tenants, and these tenants will offer additional stat increases for that hero to make them more powerful. It is always good to make one hero super duper strong, because that hero can then carry you in multiple game modes. Different heroes require different tenants, and we will be using this list to inform our strategies in the game. So hopefully that's something that makes sense. Now taking a look at the Void, what you need to understand is when you get to 5 million of these, these are Crystals of Transcendence, you can get yourself access to a Transcendence hero from the Evolution Cube, and these heroes are super duper strong. Getting your hands on them is really, really important. And finally, by making a lot of progress in the game, you can advance in Realmsgate and actually get yourself these rewards, Iron Ingots, wood and also expand your progress in other game modes like the void vortex where you can also get those rewards in deeper stages and as well those rewards are available to you in the tower of oblivion's tower of dream which is currently closed for me but this is another game mode you need to want to be good at finally another game mode that gives rewards when you get deeper and progress into it is the seal land as you can see seal land has been released all the way up to seal land 28 now that's kind of scary but either way these things are coming out we're going to get more progress from it these sweeping the treasure boxes 
from the seal land are able to give you fluorite and iron ingots. The important thing with these resources is they are used in the celestial island to improve the quality of your homes and by improving the quality of homes you're going to improve the stats granted to that one hero you have. So it all comes back to these heroes here which are called homeowners and that will make them strong and powerful and help you to clear game modes. So as an early player what should you be doing? You haven't unlocked the void, you don't know what the cloud island is, you don't even have an E5, where should you be focusing? Well, first of all, you want to build yourself a good first E5 that can do lots of game modes well. We've made videos talking about this before. Often heroes we love to talk about that are good at such things are, first and foremost, Eloise. Eloise is a really good hero that's able to heal and offers tons of progress later on. You can make her a homeowner and she will perform very nicely. Another hero worth talking about is Ithaqua. She is an assassin, a massive damage dealer. She has good healing and she's able to do also, like Eloise, a lot of game modes. One issue with Ithaqua though is she doesn't have a very high health pool and she is very much a glass cannon. So she lacks the needed sustain that Eloise has. And finally, we have another glass cannon. It's Penny. She has an attack that's able to hit everybody if it crits and that's absolutely fantastic it makes her very reliable for dealing with game modes where enemies are very tough and she's actually a very reliable fortress hero for clearing fortress seal land so we like penny she does drop off first of the three so if you were to prioritize one of these as your first e5 you should probably prioritize penny last but she's still very good and these are in my opinion the top three heroes to build as a first E5, assuming we don't consider Light and Dark. If Light and Dark is something you can consider, I would definitely encourage you to think about maybe building a Drake, or if you're really crazy, go for a Russell. But at that point, you've got to be questioning, what do you get from going for Light? The answer is not that much. Dark, on the other hand, is very good, and Drake is needed on pretty much every account. I made a video about him recently saying that I think he's the best hero in the game that cannot be transcended. So yeah, Drake is fabulous. Either way, let's talk about today's strategy, and that's going to involve the Shadow Faction. What we're going to be aiming towards here is to build a team that functions well early on and can get you as much progress as possible in at least one of the game modes that we need these high-end late-game resources from. The easiest one to go ahead and do, if you focus on good heroes, is Seal Land. Seal Land is really reliable if you use an Eloise. She is the only hero that is non-transcended that you can use to do Seal Land and clear later modes. Every other Seal Land requires a Transcendence hero. For Abyss, it's Halora. For Light, it's Eos or Asmodel. For Fortress, it's going to be Sword Flash. For Forest, it's going to be Vesa. And for Dark, it's Aspen. These are heroes we don't really have access to in the early game. Eloise, on the other hand, you can get straight away as your first E5 so it is a smart decision. So, let's say we want to build Eloise as our first E5. She is a ranger. Now that we've got her up, we've unlocked the void, we can start using her in that, and that's going to be great. Things we probably haven't done with an Eloise is complete Tower of Oblivion. For that, you're going to probably want a 9-star Ignis to get this passive here that gives her some control immunity. So there's an early game strategy. Build a 9-star Ignis with an E5 Eloise. That pairing is super duper nice. At 9 stars, she'll get this passive, which means when Ignis dies, the hero next to her, which will be Eloise, hopefully, you will give 100 energy to, and they will gain 100% control immunity. So waves that were providing you problems no longer will. Things like Mim waves you will find as you imprint up Eloise she's able to deal with, but you will probably need a good artifact on your Eloise, whether it's Golden Crown or Augustus Magic Ball. So that's one caveat about this strategy. It does require you to have a splendid Augustus Magic Ball or a Golden Crown that's been upgraded somewhat. It allows Eloise to be tanky and have more survivability. If we go take a look, if we focus on Eloise by going to the Celestial Island, let's go see who her tenants are. By going to the Shadow Faction, you can see Eloise requires Flora, Ithaqua, and Noske, Gustin, Jara, Sarja, Tix, Mim, and Annabelle, and finally, Carry and Amon Ra. What we can instantly say about this is one hero in each slot is very, very good, apart from maybe slot two. There's nothing that amazing about Sarja, Jara, or Gustin. Either way, let's look at the tenants we have. In tenant spot one, our immediate pick is going to be Ithaqua. Ithaqua is a very reliable damage dealer, and I mentioned she's another really good first E5. So Eloise plus Ithaqua works really nicely. As well, Ithaqua will play towards Eloise's weaknesses. Eloise is a slow, sustainy, tanky hero. Ithaqua is a high damage dealing glass cannon. Both complement each other fantastically. So game modes that you can't do with Eloise, you can hopefully do with Ithaqua. 
Moving to tenant spot two, you'll probably just want to save Gustin copies to build him at some point. He is the best slot here. Priests get a lot of attack bonuses. You will find that he is the best one to put in slot two. Tenant spot three, this is where we have a choice between Annabelle and Tix. Annabelle is a priest and probably the better choice, but Tix offers productive performance in game modes that we otherwise might not be able to do, such as beating Death 100 in Aspen Dungeon, and maybe having some necessary attack steel that's going to help you in later stages of Broken Spaces, which is going to allow Ithaca to perform better so she can deal lots of damage in those game modes and get you far. Finally, tenant spot 4 is between Carrie and Amon-Ra. Amon-Ra is the better pick, as she is a priest, but Carrie is able to solo her seal land, and also is a ranger, so it doesn't require you to spread across multiple guild techs. Ideally, we'd want both on our account, as well as Drake, but really, it's up to you which one we go ahead and build. So suddenly, just by looking at this tenant menu, we've started to think about heroes we want to build to E5 after we've built up our LOEs. What's even more interesting is three of them were in the Shadow faction. That's going to give us more E5s that are going to help us in Shadow Seal Land. So if we go ahead and build LOEs as our first E5, we can then consider building Ithaqua, who can complement us, or Tix, who as well can patch in game modes we're not good at. Now, one issue with this strategy is it requires lots of guild tech. For LOEs, you're going to need Ranger guild tech, for Tix, you're going to need Mage, and for Ithaqua, you're going to need Assassin. And if you go to the guild and take a look at your guild tech, you are often limited on how quickly you can level this stuff up. Yes, you can get these rings done, but it really depends on your income of guild coins. If you're a slow player, you'll find that guild coins are coming in fairly quickly compared to your progress, and that's good. But if you're a spender and you're accelerating your progress, you might find that you're not quite able to make the most progress you can because you're spending too quickly and building lots of E5s that you don't have the guild tech to back them up. So oftentimes you may argue it's not good to go ranger, mage, and assassin. In that case, you might want to consider some other areas that have holes in your strategy. It could be to go ahead and build a penny. She is a ranger. She is in the fortress faction. She can be used to clear fortress seal land. Also, by building her in the fortress faction, you will get glory challenge rewards because she is an E5 that is a fortress. And at the moment, we've just been talking about shadow heroes. And once you get a shadow hero to E5, you'll get yourself a nine star puppet, but no more after that. If you look at a different faction, such as the fortress faction, we'll get ourselves a nine star puppet in the fortress faction, which can help us to make progress. As well, if we consider the light and dark factions for a second, if we build a dark hero to E5, we'll get a nine star puppet there too. So that could be Drake if you're going to go for assassins. It could be Carrie. It could be Amon Ra. That's assuming you want to use them as tenants for your LOEs. Either way, what we're discussing here is the idea of focusing heavy on LOEs, bringing in shadow heroes to complement her, and by using them, you're patching in your abilities in various game modes and allowing yourself to perform as well as possible in Shadow Seal Land. So that, for me, is a really viable early game strategy that a lot of you should consider. By also using mages, rangers, and assassins, we're opening up further options as we approach later game. By using this strategy, we will have built an Ithaqua, and Ithaqua deals a lot of damage and synergizes with the mage, Delacium. Delacium has a chance to extend the remaining rounds of a damage over time, attribute reduction, and control effects on a target. That means you're going to increase the amount of damage over time being dealt by Ithaqua. That's fantastic. That means enemies will take more and more and more damage, and it increases all of those effects. So Ithaqua eventually stockpiles to be doing a ton of damage because the damage over time is getting increased more and more and more, and then further extended through Delacium's abilities. This is very, very strong for dealing a lot of damage. And he's a mage, so you don't need to focus on a different tech. As well, Delacium as an E5 can clear Abyss Seal Land. So suddenly we're starting to think about other factions. As well, he's Abyss, so that's going to get you a 9-star puppet from the Glory Challenge for building him to E5. For the Forest faction, we have Rogan. Rogan boosts Assassins twofold with his Warpath Roar. That's also going to help your Ithaqua to make her nice and powerful. Another thing worth mentioning is that Rogan's Delacium and Ithaqua is a really solid core if you're trying to fight broken spaces. Add to that a Drake, and suddenly you have one of the best PvE teams possible, because with Drake's defense down debuff, he's going to allow your Ithaqua to deal even more damage, which then synergizes further with Delacium, and you're getting more and more damage. And by having ticks on our team, we are giving ourselves much-needed attack steal by swapping our attack with them, and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, allowing us to steal attack from the opponent to make them ultimately deal no damage to us, so we can just go and do as much damage as we want, all the while focusing on LOEs by using Tix and Ithaqua as tenants for her. At no point have we discussed 
a transcendence hero. And that is the beauty of this early game strategy. It does not require you to have 5 million crystals of transcendence. It does not require you to buy cores and use them here, and therefore doesn't rely on a very powerful transcendence hero. That means when you do finally get the option of a transcendence hero, you are spoilt for choice. You could go with someone like Sword Flash and lean towards dealing lots of damage, and that's excellent if that was something you wanted to do. On the other hand, you might find you want to go for someone like Halora, and you want to go ahead and try and complete Abyss Seal Land, but that would entirely depend on whether you have the artifacts to do that. So remember how early on I said I wanted to talk about realistic goals and expectations? A lot of this strategy depends on the artifacts you have. Now, you could go and focus on Augustus Magic Ball for Eloise and Antler's Cane to use on your Ithaqua. As well, that Antler's Cane, or even just a Kiss of Ghost in its normal form, can be used on Ticks to allow him to beat Aspen Dungeon to death 100. So you don't need Punisher of Immortal. You could just go in with Augustus Magic Ball and Antler's Cane, and that's all you need to do Abyss Seal Land. So you could go ahead, if you really wanted, and build Halora as your first Transcendence Hero. You could then lean to building multiple Ignises, build her to E5, and then have two 9-star Ignises, because that strategy will then allow you to do Abyss Seal Land. I have a video where I use that strategy to clear it. You can go find that in my End Game Things playlist. But either way, with that strategy, we'll have Abyss Seal Land cleared to 25, and all you need for that is an Antler's Cane and an Augustus Magic Ball. So heck, this early game strategy doesn't need things like Punisher of Immortal or Golden Crown. You can literally get by with Augustus Magic ball and antlers cane so that's a very efficient strategy in the early game it requires you to build shadow heroes it doesn't require too many artifacts augustus magic ball and antlers cane are often given for free and it doesn't even rely on a transcendence hero i've just given you a suggestion as to how halora could be a good first transcendence hero of course there is the traditional route of building a sword flash and using her that works too but the big thing is we're putting all our weight onto eloise because we're trying to use her as a tenant and using her in those later game modes. So hopefully that does open doors for you and gives you a way to think that doesn't rely on Transcendence Heroes. And the funny thing is, this strategy doesn't depend on too many E5s and the direction you go with it, whether you want to go with Delacium Drake or whether you just want to go with Amon Ra, all that stuff is determined by what you want to do as a player. So it's a flexible and fantastic way to approach the early game, whether you are free to play or you are a spender. Let me know if this is an early game strategy that you've used or if it's something that you wanted to potentially consider doing on a new account. Let me know if you disagree with it. Let me know what other early game strategies you have in mind. This isn't just about early game. It is about approaching to mid game and late game by using the decisions we've used in early game. So hopefully it's going to be informative and guide a lot of you through. I will be making future videos talking about other strategies and other approaches to the early and mid games and late games and how you can think about building heroes, approaching your first Transcendence hero, and what to do when you get given the option to pick one. So hopefully today's video has been informative, opened up a lot of options, and given you a lot to think about. Either way guys, I will see you in the next video. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this and my other content too. I'll see you in the next one. Happy idling.